I went through a situation where uh, about a week ago, <clears throat> no, a little more than a week ago, I had a headache that had no explanation, and I was concerned that I might have COVID. Um, and it was plausible that I would have contacted it, though I don't know of anybody. But anyway, it revealed to me something that I think is A, reflected in many people's experience, and B, that is really significant and um, pretty scary. So I didn't think there was a high chance I had COVID. I thought there might be a 5% chance that I had COVID. But in light of that, I know that if I did have COVID, I would go to extreme lengths to protect my family from getting it. You know, if it came down to it, I would, uh, you know, if I had a trailer, I'd live in it. If I had to, I'd rent a room somewhere and isolate myself. And, you know, I'd be very careful not to give it to anybody who came to the door, but I would, you know, order food or whatever I had to do so I wasn't contacting uh, the world would be the right thing to do. But what I found was, A, okay, you think there's a 5% chance you have COVID, you need a test. Okay, so I went to get the test. I got put through a rigmarole to get the test, which was bewildering. I got the stupidest medical advice you can imagine. I was told simultaneously that I didn't need to worry about COVID because I had been misled by the press to think it was common. And then I was told if I had it, there would be no way to protect my family from getting it too. Was that the same person who told yeah. you those two things? same person told me that inside of three sentences of each other. Um, so that was an official medical consultation. Then they didn't know what test they were giving me. I said, is this the PCR test? Oh, we don't know. Really? You don't know if it's the PCR test? Can you find out? Can you look it up? Do you have the, the white paper that comes with the damn test? Um, well, I did find out it was the, the, paper te the uh, PCR test. Um, but anyway, I went, I got the swab, and then I waited, and I waited, and I waited for a result, right? And while I waited, I was in the situation, do I assume that I do have it? In which case, should I be at a hotel while I'm waiting for this test? That doesn't make any sense. On the other hand, it doesn't make any sense not to do that. So I was caught in a middle ground that I know is stupid, which is I was wearing a mask in the house, right, all the time. But I wasn't insisting that you guys wear masks, which probably if I did have COVID would be the minimum thing necessary right? I left all the windows mm. open. So we had airflow. I spent mm. as much time outside as I could. But the point is the limit of what you can do if you think there's a 5% chance you've got it is very different than what you should do if you actually do have it. Yeah. And it was a completely incoherent response. And I have a sense that what other people... Is, isn't that the word that more than anything else describes the, the collective response to this virus? Incoherent. Incoherent. Yeah. Absolutely incoherent. And then <clears throat> ultimately... I did get my test results back. They were negative. But it doesn't mean that much. Why? Because... Well, but before you explain, that, I mean, this is super important, but um, really you had none of the other symptoms and they disappeared quickly. And so with, in, in concert with a negative result, it seems, it seems likely that that is an accurate negative result. However... Yeah. I mean, I took my temperature daily. It never went up. So I had no other symptoms. The headache went away. I never figured out what it was about, but probably just a stray headache. But the point is, okay, I get my result. And then I start looking into its false negative rate. And its false negative rate is through the roof. And it varies widely depending upon how many days into symptoms you actually had the test taken. Because guess what? Its efficacy is density dependent. Right. It's <laughs> exactly. <laughs> and so anyway, my point is, I think, first of all, every I just coughed during this little chat. That is plausibly the first cough of a uh, COVID uh, set of symptoms, right? But almost certainly not. Right. At the point that you cough, do you take action, right? So we've been handed a, well, you don't want to give other people COVID thing, but we have not been handed good tools with which to know if we have it yeah. or to trigger the top level action that you would want to take if you did have it. Yeah. And my guess is, Almost everybody is navigating this badly. Almost everybody is probably rationalizing to themselves that I must not have it until it's way too late, at which point um, there's A, less they can, you know, do we know about how much COVID is responsive to our behavior? In other words, the difference between a case that is quick to go away and one of these cases that 
gives people symptoms for months down the road. I haven't seen those data. If I haven't there. seen them either. And aren't they, I mean, they, they would be relatively easy to collect. And there's some that would be the most interesting and important for those of us who could actually make sense of, okay, given that I can't trust the the collaborations of data that we're seeing thrown at us, uh, I'd like to be able to make my own assessment. Right. Yeah. Does does laying low, if if you think you've got it, um, have a an impact on the course of the disease? I think it almost certainly has to, but I don't think I've, I don't think the data are out there. At right. least not available. And the fact that you and I are, even if they are, the fact that you and I, looking at all the places that we do look, are unaware of what the advice would be about how to keep a case mild, if such advice exists at all. Mm -hmm. The fact that you don't have a test that's worth a damn. And therefore, yeah. you know, lots of people are uh, getting false negatives who are positive and then acting in presumably reckless ways as a result of it. The whole thing is Wait. setting us up for failure. That's the point is yeah. we are being set up not only for personal, sometimes catastrophic medical failure, physiological failure mm -hmm. by our lack of information, but we are being set up for epidemiological failure on the basis that the data is too slow to emerge, it's too low quality, and the advice on what you're supposed to do is anecdotal at best. So lots of the answer is lots and lots of people are dying. And as much as this disease isn't as deadly as we feared, it is potentially much more destructive. So yes. every time you hear, oh, it's not that serious because the death rate per infection is low, you should ask the question, okay, but how much quality of life is being lost by people who recover or somewhat recover? Um, because the, uh, the stuff I'm reading is certainly very frightening on that front. Yeah, no, absolutely. And here, actually, if you want to show this, Zach, um, here's just a, it's a science news article. So it's published in, you know, one of the top, uh, to your science journals in the world, but it's one of these news articles uh, from brain fog to heart damage, COVID-19's lingering problems alarm scientists. And it starts with an extended anecdote um, about a uh, neuroscientist uh, who is 38 and has her own lab at University College London, um, but who having quote unquote survived COVID finds herself still with sufficient um, both uh, anatomical and physiological symptoms in terms of joint and muscle pain, but also um, neurological symptoms. Um, like she, she is, she, she says she has brain fog and is and such that she cannot do the work that she is accustomed to doing. And that this is uh, now, I think months, Oh, it says she said just three weeks since March when her body temperature was normal. So she's not dead. Therefore she doesn't count as one of the deaths. And this is, it's, it's a terrible way of assessing the impact of a disease, right? right. Deaths versus not deaths. Well, this, this woman's career may be over. May, may be over. And we also don't know. She's young. She's in her thirties. Right. We also don't know, you know, as we've discussed models of senescence and the force that pulls you towards the grave, we don't know how much life has been lost. The fact that you die from the initial infection yes, is yes. one thing, but if you've had 15 years knocked off your life, that's not an insignificant fact. So how many lives versus how much life? It's a how different way life? of counting. It's both counting, but it's it's just a tiny bit more nuance. It's just a little bit more uh, categorization that is required to imagine sort of actuarially how, you know, what was your expected life uh, life expectancy. Um, and you know, in 50 years we might be able to know, right. But it would, it's, uh, it's going to be such noisy data that we might never be able to know, but of people who tested positive and had cases that were serious enough to be noted, um, do they live less time than, uh, are expected by, uh, life expectancy tables? Yeah. And the prediction is that they will, although again, that's only counting just actual, you know, number of amount of moments lived yep. as opposed to quality of life. Right. And the quality of life thing, you know, it's very hard to tell from the reports. The reports are frightening of what people experience. Yeah. But um, there is, you know, basically people are having an attack on the tissues across their body, which gives a huge diversity of symptoms. I'm also hearing about the recurrence of these symptoms. I have one friend who has a pattern where he had it months ago and he recovered and every month it recurs and the pattern is that the degree of severity decreases over time. This is one 
person. I consider him highly reliable in mm -hmm. terms of the pattern he's experiencing. But the point is, the diversity is way too high to even know how to count the damage here. Yeah. And that, maybe just one more thing quickly before we, we finish for this top hour. Um, that is part of what prompted a bunch of uh, scientists uh, to uh, create their own vaccine. So this is published in MIT Technology Review, which is a very highly regarded publication. Uh, and the headline is, for those listening and not watching, some scientists are taking a DIY coronavirus vaccine and nobody knows if it's legal or if it works. Okay. Fair enough. Um, it's the you know the story goes on. This is their site here. Um, they are calling themselves the Rapid Deployment Vaccine Collaborative, and there's you know it's 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 fascinating. There's there's a bunch of good stuff here about what they're doing, what they're trying to do, what they are not promising. Um, but their basic point is, we don't foresee a uh, a valid and reliable vaccine coming anytime soon. And given that, and given how much we're seeing about, um, yes, pretty low death rate, but really high collateral damage rate from this virus, uh, we are going to prioritize uh, creating a vaccine for ourselves. And so they're doing, it's it's kind of citizen science by scientists. Yeah, George have, Church is a big yeah, big name. Ex exactly. So very important person. Um, you know, neither of us has we, we just came uh, became aware of this, you know, like a half an hour or so before the podcast. So we have not fully vetted this. But I guess one question that shows up is um you know, just what do you think? Like should should citizen scientists um even be allowed to um with tools that they have access to because some of them have research labs create their own um, you know, taking full responsibility for what happens um, if it doesn't go right, um, their own vaccines at home. And, my, and, you know, my first response is, yeah. Well, yes and no is my <laughs> response. Now, it happens. I'm reading here what their mechanism is. And mm -hmm. basically, it's a synthetic peptide. They say these peptides are small, synthetically produced uh, portions of viral sequence. Yep. Now, what this means is that they are delivering proteins, which are matches for proteins produced by the virus. And therefore, what they are doing is they are triggering the immune system to react to antigens that the virus itself produces so that when the virus shows up, your immune system recognizes ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Now, that strikes me as much more likely to be safe than the alternative, mm -hmm. which is to produce an inactive virus which therefore informs the immune system by actually diversifying in your system and uh, spreading antigens by a mechanism that doesn't make you sick but does uh, infect cells. Yeah. Right? Now, it, it's likely that... Or, um, or the third case is to kill off a virus or inactivate it so that ah. your immune system just sees those particles itself. Right. And, and they say here also that you know, the antigen portion that they've chosen could be substituted by others. For example, the example they give is the recombinant SARS-CoV-2 spike RBD. Uh, and that, um, you know, for me, what that calls up is, okay, well, uh, the efficacy of this or really any other vaccine, and they say, too, this doesn't have to be for this, you know, you, you could use this mechanism, this kind of this framework um, with other antigens from other viruses to make uh, vaccines for other viruses, um, that it is likely to be highly different in efficacy depending on which particular antigen you use. And it's going to be difficult to predict in advance which antigen is most likely to produce the appropriate response in your own body. Right. But let's put it this way. This is potentially a good idea. The mm -hmm. fact that they are not using virus decreases presumably to zero the chances of a recombination event informing the virus of something it doesn't yet know, yeah. um, the actual virus. Um, so peptides, probably a good choice. However, the problem is you're, you're playing with the information that the immune system uses to understand what antagonists it is encountering. And so the possibility exists, for example, to trigger an autoimmunity by leading... So You've got selection inside the body functioning to train the virus to be invisible to immune systems. That means the closer it gets to self, the harder it is for the immune system to fight. Mm -hmm. That's a go-to strategy. It's part of you know AIDS, basically. Uh, 
HIV digs a hole in the immune system, which it then disappears into more or less. That's, so, that's what an autoimmune disease means, that it tricks your body into thinking it's you so that your own body doesn't go after it. Well, no. An autoimmune disease, let's say that a virus- Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. A virus yes, mimics yes. your own particles, yes. and then the immune system mm -hmm. chases it, and it starts reacting to stuff that's ever closer to you, and right. then sooner or later it's attacking yes. you know, your own tissue, like uh, cartilaginous tissue and- rheumatoid arthritis, for example. Right. No, I misspoke. Um, yes. But <clears throat> but the point is, if you're, I'm not saying this isn't worth it in this case. I share the authors of that um, paper's fear about the danger with COVID and the necessity to do something. Mm -hmm. But in general, do we want people messing around with informing immune systems, you know, uh, based on these things? There's a, there's a big hazard here. So the point is, we really ought to be having a proper discussion about the costs, risks, and benefits of allowing this sort of behavior. And yep. the problem is we can't do it in an environment where the New York Times is telling people that subways are probably safe and, uh, you know, uh, the who is telling us that masks don't work and all of this stuff that's clearly cooked up for reasons that have nothing to do with our actually being informed. Yep. So anyway, yep. very important problem to be solved.